welcome to today's uh, Modern Day Warrior program. Today we have Jeremy Hahn, Director of Corporate Strategy at Adam Koo's Learning Technology Group yeah. and Strategic Business Coach for Gazelle International. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Kimbo. Um, I noticed that you, you, know, you wrote uh, a book or you co-authored a book called yeah. Winning the 21st Century yeah. Game. Yes. I love, you know, we brought you in to give, really share your story, your background, your insights with those you've you worked with, you know, CEOs, executives, big companies and small companies, right. and really help our audience right. understand what needs to be worked on, developed, so they can really become the best modern day warrior. Right. Do you mind if I just start off by asking a simple question, you know? Uh, in three sentences, uh -huh. who are you? Who do you help? How do you do it? So my name is Jeremy, and I'm as part of the corporate strategy um, team in Adam Koo, part of the ma management team, the leadership team. Um, so my role specifically is to help my CEO to look at the whole company because we've got many different business units, right? To look at the overall company and see how do we increase the net value of the company, yeah. right? So the sum is, of course, larger than all the individual pieces. Yeah. So what is really the real value of the company? So that's what I do. And as a Gazelle's international business coach, what I do is I work with C teams, management teams, to ask the same question, how do we scale up our business? Right. How do we come up with a strategy to beat the competition? How do we align everybody to this strategy that we want to? How do we set a rhythm in the company to make sure we get there? Because that is actually the biggest problem, executing a strategy. I help um, business leaders and their C teams. Um, very often we cascade down to their middle management as well. And there's another thing that I do, which is to write books. And I'm an author, I just mentioned, I wrote the book Winning the 21st Century Game with Adam Koo. Uh, who himself is a best-selling author, by the way, and you know he's like the Anthony Robbins of Asia. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So we wrote that book because of um, we look at how people are actually reacting to the changes in the 21st century, right? And we and we find that a lot of people are actually not prepared. Right. They come to an education system that says that okay, you know, um, if you hit this milestone, you get this degree, you work for this big organization, you kind of see that your path is straight, right? Mm. But then things got disrupted. And we wrote that book to say, how do you handle that? Can I um, ask you to elaborate a little bit, just what kind of specific trainings you do with uh, Adam Koo? So our company has three main parts, right? So the first part, which is the company that started with, is the school's training with training with youths, right? So we have this keynote program called I Am Gifted So Why You that's helped like hundreds of thousands of young people in this region, mm. not just in Singapore, in this region, right? So basically that program says that every one of us is gifted. How do we find that giftedness? And then we have the schools program, which we have um, gone further than that. We do outdoor education, we do 21st century skills, we do service learning, you know, we do academic study skills. Um, and then the other arm of the business that's very big is what we call personal development. Right? And that's where we have investment training, where Adam himself teaches his secrets right, of investment. So we have things like equities, um, forex, trading. And then the next arm of the business is what we call the corporate training business. Right, and so that's where we deal with corporates, um, we deal with executives, and we work with the MNCs. Um, one area that's specific to myself is business coaching. Right? And that's because as we grow the business, the corporate training business, we realize that actually strategic planning is a very necessary um, tool um, or skill in, the, in, in, in an organization. Right? And because we work with Gazelles Internationals from the US, Gazelles Internationals help more than 2,000 companies across the world to scale. It's based on this book. <coughs> Scaling Up by Vern Hanish. He's a guru, right? well-known guy. His book won seven awards. And basically, the methodology that we teach is based on his book. Right? He has helped more than 2,000 companies to scale. And we want to take that to Asia. And so I work with a few other coaches from Gazelles. But essentially, what we do is we take the concepts in this book and turn it into strategy mm. um, for the companies. I want to ask you this. You, know, okay. you work with CEOs, senior executives, um, and you know, a lot of big companies. Why do they right. invest? in this kind of training? Why do they invest in coaching and uh, you know, competency-based training? You know, this is an interesting question because Forbes uh, actually wrote an article on this, right? They said that you know, 20 years ago, executive coaching is almost like, doesn't exist, right? 20 years later today, it's a billion dollar industry, right, in the US. And those people who take executive coaching are not, you know, for the junior staff, right? And they're not the small companies. You have your GEs, your IBMs, your Googles, your Apples that are investing the bulk of this $1 billion in executive coaching, 
right? And this article actually asks why, what happened, right? I have two answers to this. Um, one answer is my own, and the, an the other answer is from the article. Mm -hmm. The answer from the article basically says that leaders cast a long shadow, right? And the better your leader gets, his influence spreads wider, mm -hmm. right? So the net effect of investing in him, the net return is bigger. And Price Waterhouse did a research, and it's in that article. It says that on those people who were surveyed that did executive coaching, average ROI seven times. Some companies even say it went up to as high as forty-nine times. It's very impressive, right? Mm. I have another answer to 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 why executive coaching has become more important because with the twenty-first century, actually the business environment has just become so much more complex. Right. Futurists, social scientists tell us that in the last three years, there were more changes than the last 30 years. And I think it is because leaders are beginning to realize that my past experience does not really help me to deal with the complex environment. Um, that's why they need coaches. Things just have gotten more complex. They just need to up that level. Right. So I have this analogy because, um, you know, in Singapore at least, right, people still have this concept that, oh, you know, um, business coaching is for the, the startup entrepreneur who doesn't know anything. But whereas in the US, you have like the top CEOs, only they go for business coaching, right? So I like to use this analogy like in sports. Um, you, you, when you become like an Olympic level, you will realize that the higher you go up, the more you need a coach. Because the competition gets more intense. You don't go there and say, I'm a, I'm a really Olympic standard. No, I don't need a coach. The coach is only for those newbies, right? Mm. So I think that's the analogy I would like to use things just got more competitive, more complex. Mm. I, I agree. Um, when I think about it, right, I remember someone coaching me and telling me the same thing, going from zero to 60, zero to 70, you get a teacher, a trainer, you can go pretty fast. Yeah. But when you're at the upper edges, 80, 90%, getting to that, that yeah. next level improvement, it's incremental. It requires yeah. um, a coach or a someone coach. who can give you that kind of focus. That's right. Could you just yeah. elaborate a little bit, just for viewers' sake, what, you know, how do you coach uh, senior executives and right. what kind of training they get in that a angle? Okay, so some people ask me like, what kind of a coach am I, right? So there are some that are one-to-one -one coaches and they work on like personal attributes like your EQ, your communication, your leadership style. I'm not that kind of coach, right? What I do is I help them to implement a business framework as taught in this book, Scaling Up. The framework is actually called the Four Decisions. Right. So the, these four decisions are basically the four decision areas that a CEO and his management team must get it right and must get everybody below to align to that in order to see results. Yeah. So I coach them in a very specific methodology and that is the four decisions. You used to be part of the MOE, yeah. is that correct? You were, uh, That's where I started my career. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. You know, what's the difference between, um, if you will, academic education Mm -hmm. versus uh, competency-based education. Okay, so in academic education, you have an endpoint, right? Everybody's racing towards that examinations, right? So the goalpost is kind of like fixed, right? Okay, you teach this subject, you've got this syllabus, right? You've got to cover this amount of, and then you sit for an exam, and whether you do well or you don't do well, kind of like determines, right? Whether your education ends or, you know, or it goes to the next stage. Whereas competency-based education, has no end point, right? So for example, one of the key skills that CEOs, more than 500 CEOs in the US when they did a survey on what they see as an important competency in the people they want to hire is creativity and innovation, right? That is a competency. Now, um, you can't put an end point to a competency education as in, okay, I'm going to take this certificate in creativity and once I got it, I'm creative, I passed, right? And for the rest of my life, I'm mm. creative, right? No, right, it just goes on and on. You just get better and better and better and better. So I think that's, that's actually essentially the difference. Do you mind just elaborating a little bit more um, what are competency-based skill sets? What are they? What, what's the most important ones, you think? If we think of in the context of um, people who want to advance their careers, right, or want to handle a complex situation, I think one competency that's increasingly important is really the ability to think strategically. Right, to understand strategic thinking. Yeah. Because in the past, people like to mythify you know, strategic thinking into something like, it's like, oh, you need to be like so high up, right? I always remember one of the funny incidents I had when I was working with a client, is that they showed me the strategic plan. I read it and I said, I don't understand a single thing. And I asked them, do you understand? 
right? I said, maybe I'm dumb, but no, you guys are high level people. Maybe you understand this. And they said, no, we don't understand it as well. <laughs> I said, then why do you write it like that? Oh, because our previous consultant said strategy has to be worded like that. And I was like, what's the point of a strategy if nobody can apply or, or execute it, right? So I think um, strategic thinking should be made simple enough because people just need to understand that, hey, if I want to start to go up in my career, this is a competency I need because I need to be able to look at complex environments and basically say, with the resources that I have, what choices do I need to make right, to get the best return? Right? And if you are able to do that, then you're able to show people that you are able to think on a higher level. You're able to align your thinking to bosses. In fact, you can help your boss with some of their thinking. Right? And that really, really take you to a higher level to be noticed. Right? I think that a lot of the problems that companies are facing now, it's because of not being able to apply innovation or creativity. Right? Because there's this question that a futurist once asked, how do we solve problems that are not problems yet? Right? You can't apply a formula to, to solve that. Right? The only way, I mean, creativity is about finding answers that don't exist, finding solutions that don't exist. Right? So I think that is a, a skill. Right? And people tend to think that creativity is not a skill, it's a talent. Right? Oh, you know, Leonardo da Vinci, you know, Michelangelo, you know, Michelangelo, you, know, you pronounce it the Italian way. Right? Um, they are just born with creativity. But actually, you know, people say that creativity is a skill. It is actually something that you can, you can um, put to use, you can practice. It is actually looking at things from different angles or, or skills or solutions from different disciplines and putting it together to solve a problem that has not been solved before. Right? You're finding your answers in different areas rather than the same old area. Right? So essentially that's creativity and people think that you know, it has to be some like mythical you know, inspiration, but yeah. actually it's not. It can be learned. Considering creativity and innovation and strategic thinking, right? How do you see that in, a, in today's population? Um, I don't see it a lot, right? And I think it's really because I, if you talk about the Singapore context or the Asian context, these are just not emphasized or they are taught wrongly. People kind of like compact compartmentalize education to say, okay, this is academics. Then if you've got time, then this is creativity, right? But actually, creativity should permeate everything that we do. Right, in every subject, in every discipline, in every activity. Um, so let me share you an example. Recently, I was reading about this article about this Italian um, business owner. He gives his employees what he called a cultural allowance. Right? So if you take your family to watch a play, to go to an exhibition, he, pays, he gives you a, a sum of money to cover that because he believes that beauty is creativity and he's in textiles business. Right? And he believes that everybody should immerse themselves with beauty and creativity comes out in the way they work. Whichever you know, area you work in, creativity comes out, right? So that's what I mean by, you know, we need to understand first that creativity or strategy thinking, these are ways of thinking. They're not like, okay, go learn this. Okay, go learn that. But you can't compartmentalize, but that's still the way we see it. Oh, if you reach a certain level, then you go for strategic thinking, right? You go for strategic planning. But no, every level you should be thinking strategically, asking yourself, hey, I only have so much resources and then I have to hit this goal. What is the best way? Rather than just, okay, follow instructions, right? Yeah, or follow the job description, right? Yeah, so I think that's why, I mean, we, we misunderstand these two concepts and that's why it's not permeating the way that people think. If I can actually, it's my two cents thinking on it, you know, creativity, innovation, strategic thinking, it's actually innate, right? Innate, We, yeah, we have exactly. it already. Right. It's just perhaps we're not utilizing it or yeah. developing it. You're um, not taught how to, right? To really take advantage of it, correct? Exactly. Is that fair? Yeah, it's like you have to do this to be creative, but no, mm. right? It's already in you, like you said. Do you think uh, these lack of skills or maybe the underdevelopment of these skill sets are preventing some aspiring modern day warriors from getting promoted or hired into that dream job or that dream business that they want to get into? Definitely, right? Because you know, in the 21st century, right? Then one of the bywords is value creation, right? So in the past, you have lean management, all these, they want to talk about productivity. Now we talk about value creation. How do you create exponential value? How do you be that guy in the business that is different, in the company that's different, right? So, um, Coco Chanel had this very famous quote. She's, she said, if you, don't want to, if you want to be irreplaceable, be different. Don't be perfect, don't be good, don't be excellent, be different, yeah. right? And we be different by our creativity. Yeah. So you need, among, among all very talented executives, who stands out, yeah. the one that's different. Can I yeah. ask, in the context of Asians, 
often the poppy that stands up gets cut down yeah. is kind of the saying <laughs> or the thought process. How does that jive? How does that work for right. our, our viewers who feel like I need to play Fun in the fun, context right. of you know, yeah. Singaporeans or Vietnamese or Chinese? We don't stand out like that. We need to work in that yeah. group. How, what's your thoughts? That's where another very important skill that comes in, that's really your EQ, right? It's like when you stand out, people want to know what's your motive, right? Are you standing out so that you outshine, so that you know, I get ahead of all you guys and then you know, basically make it a competition or if I stand out, it creates value and everybody shares in that value, right? Um, that it's created. So I think it goes back a lot to intentions and motivation and how you relate to people. Are you able to convince them that, hey, you know, if I do this, everybody stands to benefit, but if you are seen to be selfish, then of course that happens. I don't think it's just Asia, but anywhere else, yeah. So would you suggest that um, Asians don't be limited by this belief of that course. they need to conform? I think so, yeah. Because think about it from, from the boss's point of view, right? If you are creating value and you stand up because you create value and everybody benefits, who wants to stop you? But I have had colleagues in the past, right, um, when the boss is not around, they're asleep in the meeting. But when the boss is around, they ask a lot of questions, they give a lot of suggestions. And everybody knows what's your intention, right? <laughs> yeah, so that's what I mean by you must be genuine in creating value. So when you stand up because you're really good and you are prepared to show people that, hey, you know, I'm not selfish about this, then I think it's just human nature to say, hey, we want this guy to succeed as well. I always like to ask our guests to give three actual items that uh, our viewers, our modern day warriors, can right. take away and action to develop a specific skill set. Right. So we have talked about strategic planning, we have talked about creativity, and I think the really um, essential way to really get yourself good in this counting is to read. So one of the action plans I think we need to read, and you know, Singapore is notorious, they did a survey, right? I think only one out of five Singaporeans that read a book a year, right? Um, I always hear my mentor says this, right? He says, whatever comes out, whether it's in words or in actions, in the kind of value you create, it's a result of what you put in. Right, so the less you put in, the less it's going to come out. Right, or what it comes out is stale because you studied this like ten years in school and you didn't refresh. Right, so read. That's one. Right, so for creativity, for strategic planning and things like that, the next thing you need to do is you need to do it. Right, if you're like, well, I'm not good enough. I don't know enough. You know, and you know, these competency things are you no. Know, you don't like need to. I have a degree in creativity first before I do something creative. Like, you get better as you do it. Right? You get better as you do more strategic thinking, strategic planning, and that's when people start to notice you. They say, hey, actually this guy um, has done this a few times. Um, not bad, he may not have gotten it, but you know, he's demonstrating some potential. Why don't I give him now more input or more resources to develop that skill, right? So these are two action steps. I can't think of a third one, because I think just doing this two is a big step already. <laughs> um, is there anything you want to share with the audience before we wrap up for today? Um, I think we have covered quite a lot of things. Um, if you really think that what I've shared is useful, I think I wrote this book with the, really the intention to help people. Um, I was featured on national radio on this book and one of the reasons they asked me why did I write this book. I wrote this book for two reasons. Um, when I was a teacher, when I was in the education, I asked myself this question, right, that um, we, in, we Asians invest so much, so much hours, so much stress, so much of our parents' money into tuition, into school, right? But look at a lot of successful people today, right? Successful in professional terms. I mean, the economy just got disrupted. They lost their jobs, right? And they are fixed with a certain mindset that prevents them from coming out of that pit. And ask myself that question. So therefore, what do we need to do to make sure we don't end up in that pit? And the second reason why I wrote this book is because I've got kids. You know, futurists tell, futurist tells us that, you know, because information doubles every year. Mm -hmm. In 30 years time, we have 1 billion times more information than we have today. That's when my kids are in the peak of their career. I'll be old by then, it doesn't matter to me. <laughs> right? And I want to make sure my kids are able to thrive and do well in that kind of environment and not fall into the same trap that a lot of people are in today. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jeremy. Thanks. Nice to I have enjoyed you. this. Thank you. Cool.